I think since the first of the year. Remember when we did Seek First and we came and we prayed and we set that verse as Seek First the Kingdom of God and His Righteousness to be our goal for this year and our the main thing that we do is focus our love and attention on God and that has just resonated with me ever since then and so I want to share with you some more thoughts along that line and, and what that looks like practically and what that means to live out of a place of seeking God first because you know as Christians we do many things. We come and serve because saved people serve people. We share our faith because we're supposed to take, you know, the gospel to the ends of the world and we're supposed to be witnesses and salvation is our win. Um, we raise godly families. If we're married, you know, we have a responsibility to parent our kids. There are all these things we're supposed to, you know, good religion is to care for the poor and the orphan and the widow. And so I feel like ever since I was little, there has been this, like, different people come and they have biblical backing for saying, like, this is the main thing that you need to be doing. <laughs> like, you have to be on missions because God said go. Or no, you have to care for the orphan because God said that's good religion. And save people, serve people, so you have to be on a team. And you were created for intimacy in the garden, so you have to be in worship and intimacy. And prayer, God does nothing without prayer. So really, you should spend most of your time in your prayer closet and then an itty bitty time doing and I'm like, I don't know, what am I supposed to be doing? There are all these things that are the main thing, right? And so sometimes it can be confusing, and I just wanted to be honest about that, and that I was just really wrestling with, okay, God, if all these things are great, what is the main thing? And if you say, seek first the kingdom of God, what does that look like, and how does everything else, you know, how does it impact the things that I do? So that's kind of where I want to spend my time this morning. Um, and what I realized as I was just praying about this and seeking God about this, I sound funny, so just ignore that and listen to me anyway. It's okay. Um, they will figure it out. Um, as I was seeking God about this, it's not <clears throat> that any of these things are not good that we do. They are good and we should be doing them. But seeking first is in the heart. And if that's not right, what we're doing is dead works. Does that make sense? So it doesn't change what we do because God calls us all to different things and some are prophets and some are evangelists and he might really give you a burden to help feed the hungry and somebody might be really called to be an intercessor and spend all this secret time in prayer with the Lord. One is not better than the others. We're a body of Christ and we're all called to different things. But one thing remains and that is that our heart posture has to be to have an intimate love relationship with Jesus above all the things that we do. Because obedience bursts out of love is what we're after. It's not that we have to serve him. It's not that we serve him because we feel bad if we don't. It's not that we earn something by serving him. It's we love him and therefore we serve him. Obedience is what we're called to. We're, we're called to listen to what he says and obey. But if we're just doing it like, but we don't really want to do it. And what we're doing is the main part of our lives, not our love for Jesus on the inside. We get out of balance. So I want us to just do a little bit of a heart check this morning and see where our intimacy and our love relationship with the Lord is at. See how we're doing in our hearts. Can we do that together? I love this quote by Beth Moore. She says, trying to know God and serve him before we come to love him is exhausting. I think that is just, it sums it all up right there. I could just stop preaching now. But, you know, our, our mission as a church is no, grow, do. And Brad and I labored in prayer like God called us that that's like, yes, we need to know God. But that knowing is an intimate knowing of two close friends, of like not a head knowledge, it's a heart thing. So our inner world, our love relationship has to be larger than our outside works for God. And don't get me wrong, as pastors and as a church, here at Uncommon, our main win is salvation. And if 100 people came up to give their heart to Jesus every single Sunday, like let's say that that happens today, I will cry tears of happiness. But still, that is not my ultimate reward or goal because I'm 
loving, seeking, and saving the lost because I love Jesus. Like, I love him because he first loved me, and therefore, I want to see people get born again. And therefore, if 100 people don't get saved, I'm still happy and content, and I'm good in my relationship with the Lord because happiness doesn't come from some sort of outward result of what I do or success. Because if Jesus is my goal, like, Jesus is always with me. So I am always winning. Like, life is good because he is my ultimate reward. And Jesus doesn't leave me or forsake me, so we don't need to be upset or sad or discontent because our being is anchored in intimacy and love for him, not anything else. Then everything else is extra. It's bonus. And, you know, you could do the same thing with two different... Um, heart postures or attitudes or out of two different motivations and they look very same on the outside and only you know the inside but one is good and one is not <laughs> one is happy and one is sad do you know what i mean and i want to tell you a story about that so our son josh he's not here today but he called us recently and we're texted really on the family group chat and he's like i joined a soccer league so he's joining this adult soccer league. And I've been a soccer mom like my whole life and now that we're empty nesting, I'm like, I don't know, I have no games to go to. So I was like, yes, I wanna go watch him play soccer again. You made me a soccer mom again, this is awesome. So I'm excited about it, but it made me think of all the games we've been to. And for those of you who know us, we lived in New Mexico before we lived here. And like when Josh was in high school soccer, we drove all across DFW for his soccer games. I just felt like, man, and traffic, you know, all the things. But can I tell you something? Living in New Mexico and having junior high daughter in volleyball and basketball is more driving. We played, so we lived in a small town called Clovis. If you don't know where it is, look it up later. But like, there was only one school in Clovis. So if we were gonna play a game, which of course, that's the reason you're on a team, you had to drive to Hobbs and where else did we drive? It was like between two and three and four hours to go anywhere to see another school to play a game. Can I just tell you, I would be so happy on game day. I would pack up my little snacks. I would listen to worship music. I would drive. I'm like, I'm so excited to see Joy play. And I mean, if anybody else had asked me to drive four hours and sit in a high school gym to watch a team lose at volleyball and my daughter not play very much at all and it just be, you know, and then drive home again and get home at 1 a.m. And just like, if it was just a random person saying, please come do this, if it wasn't my child, it would be awful. I would have such a bad attitude. I was like, I cannot believe I have to drive three hours for this one game. That doesn't matter at all. And nobody's gonna remember it by next week. And you know, why am I doing this? But because it was my daughter and I love her. I was not complaining at all. I was like, it's game day. Oh my gosh, she's gonna be so cute playing basketball or volleyball or whatever. Like, and let's take all the girls to Brahms after. Like, I was just so invested. It mattered, why? Because I love her. And so driving three hours didn't matter at all. But do you see what I'm saying? It's the heart, love, intimate relationship that I have with my daughter means that the thing that I'm doing is very different than if I was doing it just for somebody that I didn't know. Do I need to take my earrings off? Oh yeah, says Brad. Oh my goodness. Okay, well then I'm gonna take both because I can't be lopsided, so. <laughs> it's happening. They were so small. I really thought they were gonna be okay. Oh man, oh well. But where were we? Yes, driving to Hobbs for a basketball game. When we do things, that God calls us to do out of obligation instead of love, the result is the same. We get annoyed with it, it feels like a burden, it's not an honor, but if we do it from the right heart motivation, it's worship and it's holy and it's a privilege and it's like I'm so excited. But where does that start? Because the action on the outside is the same. It's born out of intimacy or out of obligation. So our core motivator cannot be accomplishing the Great Commission or even fulfilling the call of God on our lives or being obedient in all the things or that I have to read the whole Bible or becoming successful or having significance or finding freedom. Like all these are good byproducts. They're great byproducts out of an intimate love relationship with Jesus. But it has to begin there. They are an overflow. And often stress and demand and pain and success in life derails that simple intimacy with Jesus and it's so easy to lose it and not even notice because we go about doing the exact same thing. 
But all of a sudden, you're like, I just don't feel the same about it. I just, I think I'm overdoing this, and I don't want to do this anymore, and everything just seems like such a pain. Something got lost. Or maybe you feel disillusioned and disappointed. Um, maybe you're just not content. How many of y'all know that our culture just breeds on discontentment? It's like whatever we get or whatever we have, it's just never enough. Like, that's just the American way, because we're supposed to be driven to want more and get to the next horizon. If Jesus and intimacy and love with him is our primary objective and our main core motivator, we can be content even if we have vision and want to do more in life. We can still be content right now, right where we're at, even if you're not living in the house where you want to be, even if you're not where you want to be in your career, even if you're not married yet but you really want to be, you can still be content in your relationship with Jesus because everything else is just bonus. It's just extra. And that's the secret to contentment. That's the secret to happiness. Paul talks about this. I want to read from Philippians 4, verse 11. He says, I'm not saying all this because I'm in need. He was talking about them giving to him. He was very grateful that they were giving to him. And he says, but I have, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Wouldn't you like to learn to be content whatever the circumstances? Like, that can seem so difficult sometimes. But he had learned the secret to that. He says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to be, have plenty, but I have learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether we're well-fed or hungry. I mean, how many of you can say that? That you are like just so content, even if you had to go hungry. When I have to miss lunch, I am not content. You can ask my husband. We had a Dream Team Leaders brunch at 10 o'clock yesterday. And I was like, I'm going to skip breakfast so I can eat really good at brunch. By 9 o'clock, I was like, no, I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm too hungry. I texted and I was like, oh, I was going to skip, but never mind. I'm eating right now. I don't like going without food. And Paul is like, I'm so content, whether I'm well-fed or if I'm hungry. Like, it's okay. It doesn't matter. Why is that? I think contentment is amazing, and it's so underrated. Go to Philippians 3, which is Paul again talking about this. And he's like bragging about how amazing he was before he met Jesus. So I want to read you through, but you have to think of the perspective of back then. He said, I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel, a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience of the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church, and as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. He was amazing. Like picture if you were just everything you ever wanted to be. Like you went to Harvard, you became a billionaire in your 20s. Like, um, Beyonce and Bill Johnson were your best friends. Like, you were just the greatest of all time. Like, you owned a football team. You had, um, you know, you were married and had two and a half children, and they were all just Instagram perfect and never misbehaved. Like, he's basically saying, like, I was perfect. Everybody loved me. It was amazing. And then he says in verse 7, I once thought that these things were valuable. But now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared. Can I just say, the other stuff is not worthless. Like the stuff that you have in life is not worthless. Like Brad and I just took a trip to Paris that if you guys know me, I have wanted to go there with him for 26, 27 years. And it was amazing. Like I was so excited. It is not worthless except for when I compare it to the beautiful thing, the infinite value, as Paul says, of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, garbage, so that I would gain Christ. Like, can we say that about our lives? Like, is getting married garbage? Is having a baby garbage? No, it's not, except for when you compare it to Jesus. Like, God says, seek first, and I will add all these things. He's not against all those things, but what is the heart core motivation of your life? What value do you put on that intimate relationship with Jesus? Because when Jesus is the goal, you're happy. If we're frustrated because a dream hasn't happened or a church building project isn't finished, um, whatever it might be, if we're frustrated because of that, what are we after? What is our goal if we can't be content even though we have not yet seen God give us all the things that he has promised us. Like, it's like we begin acting like he owes us something. 
Jesus is the goal. He is the win. And knowing him is the greatest thing. Everything else is extra. And when we start putting the extra in the place of Jesus, it leads to discouragement, complaining, jadedness, disillusionment, discontentment, frustration. Our happiness has to be put on the main thing, not on the bonus stuff. I love the story of the road to Emmaus, where Jesus, after he was resurrected from the dead, um, ends up walking with two of his followers who didn't know that he was alive. And they were frustrated and sad. They were disillusioned. And here they were. If you don't know the story, I would encourage you to read it in Luke 24. They were walking right next to Jesus, like the man himself, all their hopes and dreams, was walking right there with them. And they were sad because they didn't recognize it. Sometimes we are sad and disillusioned because we don't realize that the very thing that could help all of that is right here with us. Like Jesus is right here. And the reason that they were disillusioned is because they had their hopes in other things than just relationship with Jesus. And I, I want to just read it to you because it's so interesting. In Luke 24, verse 19, it says, you know, they said, haven't you heard what happened in Jerusalem? And Jesus pretended to play along and said, what do you mean what happened in Jerusalem? And they start telling him all about it. They're like, about Jesus of Nazareth, they're telling him. He was a prophet. He was powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. And here's the thing. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Their hope was that he was going to be the Messiah that was going to crush the Romans and kick them out of the country so Israel could become a powerful nation. That was their goal. And so when that hope didn't come to pass, they were sad. And Jesus was still right here, like the Savior of the universe who had just risen from the dead. But that was like somehow not enough because they thought he was going to crush the Romans. And sometimes we have Jesus like right there waiting in our prayer closet, like, where are you? I want to be with you. And we're like, well, I had hoped that by now I'd be further along in my career. I had hoped that you would help me get debt free. I had hoped that I would find more community. I had hoped that I would become a leader by now. I had hoped that our church building would be paid off by now. Whatever it is, like, is that hope greater than our intimate relationship with Jesus? Because it will lead to discontentment and frustration. The same with works and doing and serving. Like, Brad and I are in vocational ministry. Like, we've given our lives to serve Jesus. But if the work becomes more important than our relationship with him, something's awry. And it's the same for every Christian because what do we do here at Uncommon Church? Saved people serve people. We're about no grow and do. We want to do for the kingdom. Like, that is great. But if you serve God and it's not served out of love, it becomes obligation, duty, and performance instead of just a heartfelt worship to the Lord. I want to read you just a couple of thoughts that I, I was thinking about this because you could do the same thing and have it be two different things. If you want to put them up on the screen behind me, one is dead works and the other is worship. And it all has to do with heart attitude it's coming from. One is worthless. Really, it's, it's hay and stubble and it's going to burn. And the other carries eternal reward when Jesus is going to be like, well done, good and faithful servant. Here's a crown for what you did for me because you loved me. One is striving. Ever strived before, striven, strove? I don't know, but anyways. I am over striving. And I love the place where I'm at in life because I don't feel like I have to do stuff to earn God's approval somehow. I do it because I love him. So one is striving and the other one is joyful sacrifice because sometimes it's hard and it's inconvenient and it's difficult and it is a sacrifice. We're called to sacrifice, like to lay our lives down. But if it's out of love, it's like driving to a ball game for your kid, not just taking some random trip that you have to make. One is birthed in the flesh and the other is birthed in the spirit. One is a burden. When you serve and it doesn't come out of love, it's a burden. But the other is an honor. Like when you serve because you're really excited about something or someone, it's like such an honor. Like what if the White House called you and said, could you come up here? Like we have watched how you do your, you do your job, whatever it is. And they're like, could you come do that for us? Like wouldn't you be, like I get to serve my country. Like the things that we love, it's an honor to serve for. If your favorite um, 
rock star was coming to town having a concert at at t Stadium, and they're like, we need somebody, you know, just to hold their microphone until they go out on stage. Would you be like, no way? I'd be like, yes, please, you know, let me give Adele her microphone. I would be honored. <laughs> so it's all about the love and respect that we have for the person. <clears throat> Isaiah 29, 13 says, the Lord says, this is about people who do not have the right heart attitude. These people come near to me with their lips. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me, but it's based on human rules that they've been taught. This is so sad. That's what the Pharisees were doing when Jesus was here on the earth. And he called them whitewashed tombs, looking pretty on the outside, filled with dead man's bones. That is not what I want to be, and I know you don't either. And the only difference is an intimate love relationship with Jesus. We're called to intimacy. Like the original intent in the garden, God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. He wants to know you. He wants you to love him. He doesn't want to be tolerated. He wants to be adored. How are we doing for time? You know, this is not our normal time, so I can't tell how my message, like, time-wise is doing, because I'm like, I don't know. We only did one worship song, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the next scripture and just think we're going to get through it all. Amen. We can do this. The next is, you know, the perfect example for serving, and if you've been in church any amount of time, this is it, Mary and Martha, right? Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus. Martha was in the kitchen slaving away, and I just want you to put up that verse of Mary and Martha on the back screen. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, they came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him, and she had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. She was being discipled and taught by Jesus, like his very words, like in the flesh. Oh, man, I would have loved that. Go to the next slide, please. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. So she came and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work all by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few are needed, or indeed, only one. And Mary has chosen what is better. It will not be taken away from her. Leave that up, and then we're going to go through the different highlights that I've made. And I just wanted to tell you, when you start working, from the wrong heart attitude, here's what comes. First of all, it says Martha was distracted. Do you see that? She was distracted. If you go to the next slide and just track down with me. There we go. We're going to go through all these. She didn't listen to Jesus. He was right there. Like she was so distracted by the work in the kitchen. We can get so busy doing stuff for God that we don't hear his voice. Like he's talking to us. Jesus was right there speaking. Mary was listening. Martha was distracted. She didn't hear it at all. The second thing it says... She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care? When we are not serving out of a heart of love, all of a sudden we focus on what God's not doing for us. It's like, don't you care about this and that and my dream that hasn't come to pass like what we were talking about earlier? We get this like entitlement, like, God, I'm serving. Don't you care? Like, who's watching me right now? The, sec the, the next thing is, she says, my sister has left me to do the work by myself. How many of y'all know that when you serve and it's not out of love, you become like such a victim to it? Like nobody else is helping me and I'm here early and nobody's noticing, where's the rest of my team? You know, like it just becomes such a burden all of a sudden. You feel like you're all by yourself and nobody else is serving as hard as you. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Poor Martha. And then it says, you are worried. Worried. Because that love relationship is what's anchoring us in Christ. And that's where our peace comes from. And if we're serving and doing all these busy bee things, but we don't have that foundational intimacy with Jesus, we get worried about all the things. If you're worried, spend more time just loving on Jesus. And the next word, it's very similar. It says, and upset. She was upset. And I looked up that word. What does it mean to be upset? I'm like, was she angry? It sounds like she was angry at her sister, right? But it actually, that word upset in the Greek means disturbed and troubled in mind, disquieted, which means deprived of peace and calmness. It's not that she's mad and angry. She just doesn't have peace. It's like she has a troubled mind. When we serve too much, or when we serve at all, without being anchored and rooted in intimacy, when it's obedience without intimacy, we lose our peace. 
If you don't have your peace, come back and check your love relationship with Jesus. Not only serving and contentment, but one more thing that struck me with this love relationship thing is that even our theology has to be rooted in intimacy with Jesus. Remember when Jesus was here walking the earth and the Pharisees were trying to trip him up and there was a woman who was caught in the act of adultery. And the Pharisees looked at the law of Moses and it said, let's stone her. And so they brought Jesus and they said, listen, the law of Moses said that we should stone this woman. What do you say? And can I just tell you, if you had asked Jesus and the Pharisees, what is your theology on sexual purity, on biblical sexuality, on sex outside of marriage, their belief system and their theology would have been identical. They believed the same thing, which is that it was a sin to have sex outside of marriage. Jesus would say that, and so would the Pharisees. So how come there was such a different response where the Pharisees wanted to stone her, and then if you've read the story in John chapter 8, Jesus, instead of saying, yeah, we should stone her, he, he starts, he, it's, the Bible says that he starts writing in the sand. And then he said, he who is without sin cast the first stone. You know what Jesus had <laughs> that it doesn't seem like the Pharisees had was an intimate love relationship with God. And the Bible says love God is the most important thing and then love people. He had love. He had intimacy with the Father, which meant he had the Father's heart towards his woman that even though she had done something that was wrong, there was a compassion in him because of his intimate relationship with his Father. And so in John chapter 8, verse 10, it says the people left. There was nobody that was perfect. Nobody could cast a stone. So Jesus stood up again and he said to the woman, where are your accusers? Did not even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Notice that he called her to holiness. He named her sin, sin. But there was so much restoration and love that happened in that moment. There was no shame. There was no condemnation. And if we are going to be effective to reach this generation for Jesus, if we're going to share the gospel and be able to call things that are sin, that are rampant in our nation right now sin, we have to do it in love. Not just our human love, but the love of God has to permeate our words. That's the only way that restoration and freedom and salvation is going to come into that situation. Where do you get that? from spending time with Jesus. Like we can't manufacture that. People can tell when you're fake. You can't just pretend you love people. It's the love of God inside of us and that is only cultivated in your secret place with him. You can go ahead and stand to your feet. I'm about to wrap up here in just a few seconds. But theology without love and intimacy with Jesus leads to shame and death. But theology based on an intimate love relationship with the Lord leads to redemption and holiness. See the different results that come out of the same belief system. We can't just know the Bible and then spout it out at people. You have to have a love relationship with the Lord and you interpret the Bible through your theology. If your theology is based on your love relationship with Jesus. So we find contentment when we have a passionate, intimate relationship with him. Our heart is supposed to guide our works so we have obedience in love instead of trying to strive for significance and serving out of duty. We base our theology on intimacy. And lastly, I just want to just address this thing of intimacy means sacrificing your time. It doesn't mean that you have to spend all day, every day to be called as an intercessor and you don't go to work because you're just laying it all down to sit at the feet of Jesus. But at some point, there has to be a sacrifice to do what the Bible calls come away and be with him. If you love someone, if you've ever been like 
really head over heels and you're not engaged yet and you just, I remember um, Jeff who used to be our worship pastor here, he would drive down to Houston um, when he was wooing Danny and wanting to propose to her and he would drive down after work on Friday I think and you know he'd be down there and he'd come in the middle of the night in the early morning hours before Sunday service and he didn't complain about it once. Why? Because he loved her. So he wanted to drive. We don't have to spend time with God. If you have to spend time with God, you need to check your intimacy and your love. Like, can you just sit and just like your heart is tender towards Jesus and you just like feel this sense of love towards him and gratitude for what he's done for you. The Bible is full of times when Jesus got up early and got away to pray and he stayed up late and went and prayed all night. He went away to be with his father. And the Bible and God calls us to come away and be with him. Are we satisfied to be with him? You know, religion wants to keep us at like this respectful distance from God where we can sit in our chair and worship on a Sunday, but there's not an intimacy there, but God calls us closer. When you say prayer, I love this. I don't remember where I heard it, but when you say prayer, do you think a list or do you think a person? When you say prayer, are you thinking about, I get to talk to God? Or do you think, oh, I have this list of all the things I want? One is an intimacy and a love relationship. And the other one is, I hope I've done enough good work so then when I pray for all these things that I want, he's going to give it to me. It's very different. How are you coming away? Like when you have that time with God, how are you spending it? There's this quote that says, the most important part of prayer is not the result it produces, but the intimacy that it creates. You can't get an intimate relationship with someone you don't spend time with. It can't happen. You won't know them. And here's the thing, they won't know you. <laughs> like God knows everything about you, but he wants you to be with him and talk to him and listen to him. Worship him. Figure out what he likes. Make room for him to talk to you. So that's what we're going to do now, and that's why we just did the one song, is because maybe you don't have time the rest of the week to just spend all this time worshiping Jesus, but right now we do. And we have freedom in this house to just spend time with the Lord. So I'm going to read Psalm 27 and 8 as my last verse, and it says this, which was, is what I, I want your heart to hear right now. David said, my heart has heard you say, he's talking about God, come and talk with me. And my heart responds, Lord, I'm coming. So this morning, I want our heart to respond, Lord, I'm coming. If you're like, hey, it's been a while since I really and truly checked in with how is my love relationship? How is my intimacy with Jesus? I have gone a little cold. It's been a minute since I spent time. That's okay. This is your time to spend time. It's a simple, sincere relationship, and everything else is just bonus. It's not complicated. It's just we love him, and he loves us. As a matter of fact, we love him because he first loved us. So spending time with him is out of like, he loves me so much that he gave his son for me. That's the kind of God I want to know. So just close your eyes and we're going to go into a time of worship and we're going to spend this time a little bit more like a Wednesday night. If you want to come up at the altars, you can. If you want to go sit on the far end by the wall, like go make yourself comfortable if you don't want to sit in your seat. But I want you to more than paying attention to the worship team or like trying to sing every word perfectly. If you don't look at the screen, that's okay. I just want you to worship like truly from your heart. Let's just stir up that intimacy and rekindle our first love with him again. If you're here this morning and you're not right with God, but your heart's pounding out of your chest because you want to be, I want to lead you in prayer. If the last hour and 15 minutes, man, you've just known that today is the day you've got to get right with God. God's not mad at you. He loves you so desperately. He wants you to stop running and turn around and let him embrace you, wash away your sin, adopt you into his family today is your day if you're here this morning and you want to pray that prayer i i can help you i can lead you but I, I can't pray it for you you have to believe in your heart you have to pray and ask god to forgive you and to to come into your life if you're here this morning and that's you i'd, I'd like to know who i'm praying for 
It might be the first time, it might be the first time in a long time that you've prayed this prayer, but today's your day to get right with God. Um, I'd like to know who I'm praying for, so I want you to raise your hand. If you're here this morning and that's you, just shoot your hand up and say, Preacher, that's me. I've got to get right with God today. I see your hand. Is there anybody else? Good. Just shoot your hand up. I see your hand. Is there anybody else? Good. Wave it up at me. Good. I see your hand. Yeah. Anybody else? Good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yay, God. Yay, God. Yay, God. Wow. That's so fun. I, I think there were at least three or four hands. If you're watching online, just you in your living room, you in YouTube, just raise your hand and say, today's my day. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray and ask God to forgive me. I'm going to get right with God today. Um, if, if you believe this prayer in your heart, why don't you pray it out loud? Say, dear Lord Jesus, I repent. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. And I will serve you all the days of my life. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, come on, I'm so proud of you. Wow, 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 what a fun day. <laughs> yay, God, yay, God, yay, God. All right, listen, if you were one of those three or four that raised your hand, or if you're watching at home online, especially if you're watching at home online, I want you to text the name Jesus, J-E-S-U-S, to 817-405-2244. That'll send you an auto-response form. Fill that form out, click submit, because we have this wall over here that spells out the name of Jesus in light bulbs. We want to put your initials or your name on a light bulb and screw it into the Jesus wall. If you were here this morning, we want you to screw in a, a, a light bulb on the Jesus wall. Man, we want to begin to pray for you and celebrate you and encourage you in your walk with God.